Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports at WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into the store and give you guys about a two to four minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, this video is brought to you by our new website, webuyguns.com. If you are considering selling a firearm or firearms collection, please log on to our website and create an account. From there, you can submit your firearms for an offer request. With those offers, you do get a printable offer certificate, which you can take with you to your local gun store to try and leverage yourself a better deal. If you're unable to get a better deal, go ahead and sell it to us. We do provide you with a shipping label and we will pay you with either a paper check or a CH direct deposit to make the process as seamless for you as possible. Remember to go check us out at webuyguns.com. Remember the format of this video is we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. Starting off with our number one spot is a pretty interesting fire firearm and this one comes to us from Palmetto State Armory. This is the Palmetto AKV. It is a AK style pistol chambered in 9mm, fires from a closed bolt and is direct blowback. Of course being closed bolt it's a civilian semi-automatic pistol. Now this is pretty closely based off of the Russian PP-19 Vityaz, which was developed by Russia in about 2005 uh, and currently serves, about 2004, 2005, and currently serves uh, in large part with the Russian military and Russian police as well as their standard issue submachine gun. Chambered in 9mm, again, it is also closed bolt and is a direct blowback. Now Palmetto State Armory as a company is a pretty interesting one that did get started with humble beginnings in about 2008. Now they were operating out of a garage selling mostly ammunition and small parts, but from there they would develop onto being probably one of the largest domestic manufacturers and uh, retailers of firearms in the local US market. Now that's a, a pretty short period of time to get such a status, but they've done a really good job. What they mainly did is they started off by manufacturing their own parts, mainly AR-15 receivers, which is today what they are mainly known for. Uh, then a few years back, they got into AK development. Now uh, they've come out with their own AK designs that they put out, which are actually really good and they hold up pretty well. Now when it comes to the AK collecting community, a lot of people like to stay away from US made uh, AK variants. I know I myself am that way as well. I like to stay with foreign stuff like the Romanian Wassers or um, the Yugoslavian variants, you know, before the importation of those stopped and they were US made, but even those are great. Uh, I do like those. There's Kalashnikov, uh, the, the local Kalashnikov AKs, which are fine. Um, but I've stayed away from like the Century Arms uh, local manufactured stuff. Uh, now, as a local manufacturer uh, here, a domestic manufacturer in the United States, Palmetto has actually always done a really good job. The price points have been competitive with those of other things that are similar to it on the market, like Wassers. Typically, you're in about the $700 to $1,000 price range, and that's where these retail brand new. Now, right now, the pricing on these is a little bit elevated on, on the used market, as these have been a little bit tougher to get from Palmetto as brand new. So I've seen these get up, you know, at uh, you know, around the price of new ones, you know, anywhere from about $800 to $1,200 respectively, depending on the time frame. But right now they're leveling off. Um, when they're in stock with Palmetto, these sell between about eight and $900. It's typically about where you find them. Uh, for the money, it's a really, really cool concept. Uh, again, getting a domestic variation of the Vitya submachine gun and some automatic is really cool. And there's a lot of videos online that show uh, that these are very operational, very functional, um, very reliable. As most AK pattern firearms are, you can get different variations of the, the pistol braces to go on them, at least right now, including the triangle style brace, which is more uh, directly related to the uh, PP-19 as well. Now, the PP-19 is based more off the AK-74 than it is the AK-47. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Really, really cool sort of domestic Russian Kalashnikov uh, submachine gun. Uh, again, based off of the PP-19 bit, yeah. So really, really cool product. Uh, happy to get one of these in to share with you, and that'll be our number one spot today. Okay, next up, I have a really nice Kimber. Before getting into it, I did want to quickly mention that the AKV that you just saw came to us from a viewer in Maryland. So thank you so much for sending that one along to us. Now, this one comes to us from a viewer in Arizona. This is a Kimber K6S Target, and it is a beautiful 357 revolver. 
Now the standard model K6S would hit the market in about early 2016. It wasn't really widely available until about the end of 2016, early 2017. I remember that uh, fondly because there was a lot of interest in the market for that revolver. Now everybody knows Kimber, but Kimber is really mainly known for their 1911 development designs uh, and the different sort of nicer, I, I call kind of like mid-end 1911s that are put out into the market. Really, really distinguished looking pistols that everybody really likes. Now, Kimber wouldn't enter the revolver market with this line, the K6S, and still to this day is the only line that they offer. Now, the original K6S is really meant to be more of a concealed carry type revolver, uh, sold at first with a two inch barrel, sort of in the stainless package you see here, double action only with no exposed hammer, 357 Magnum. Um, really, really, really nice, small ergonomics with a really, really nice double action only trigger. Now they would come out with a double single action variant of that revolver as well. And then they would come out with this one, the target model. Now the original K6S would have a little bit of a steep price tag. Uh, MSRP was about 950, but you would find them on the market traditionally around the $800 mark. Um, of course, now the prices are a little bit higher because of the market, although I'm starting to see stuff sort of calm down. So hopefully we start to see those prices come down pretty soon. I think we're about to. Um, um, but if you compared it to other uh, similar things out on the market, like the new Colt King Cobra, which is in about the same price point, uh, you had the Ruger SP-101s, you had Taurus, uh, had a line the 85s with the 357 revolver. Um, especially if you look in the Taurus 101, the weight was very similar, size is similar, but the, the Rugers would be about at the $500 mark. So a little bit pricey for what it was. Uh, Smith & Wesson, of course, with the J-frames, uh, but a really, really nice revolver overall. Really nice trigger. I actually have an old comparison video uh, with the original K6S. Now on the target model, they would increase the length of the barrel to four inches. They would give it target sights. Of course, you have the double action, single action, a hammer on here, you have a little bit of a larger grip. The grip on the standard model, a little bit shorter. Uh, for most people, you could get uh, you could get about two fingers on it, your pinky might fall off. Uh, I do have smaller hands, so I could get my hand on the, on the revolver, uh, but, an ex but an extended and large target grip. I really, really like the single action hammer pull on this. Very, very smooth, very positive. Um, very, very nice double action, easy to stage as well. So a really, really nice revolver over well. The target models you typically find retailing right now new for about 1,000 to 1,100, used between about eight and 900 respectively. So really, really nice revolver, really, really cool. And um, again, for just under $1,000, I mean, there's a lot of other things that compete with that in that price point, but for a nice Kemper, uh, you know, there's a lot of people willing to pay it and add it to their collection because they are, you know, a really, really good refined revolver. So there's that one for you. Okay, up next is a really cool rifle that comes to us from a local customer. This is a Sig Sauer 522, which is a 22 caliber version of the 5.5X five five or the 550 series of rifles that were originally developed and distributed by Swiss Arms AG in Switzerland. Now, Sig Sauer Inc., based here in the United States, made a 5.56 domestic variation of those rifles known as the, the Sig 5.56 and the 5.51A1, which are unfortunately no longer available on the market. They made a 22 variation of that rifle as well, which is here, known as the 5.22, which was developed between or manufactured between 2009 and 2015. So again, these are no longer in production and no longer obtainable unless you find one on the used market. Now the 550 series of rifles, you know, first developed by Swiss Arms AG, now SIG holding AG in Switzerland, um, s owned by the same parent company, but not the same as SIG Sauer here today. The concept of something like this is to get something that's going to be a, a lot less expensive than those other rifles. So the 5.56 and the 5.51A1 uh, traditionally in the market would be about $800 to $1,000 respectively. I'm going back in time about 10 years ago when they were more prevalent on the market. Um, now they're going upwards of about $1,500 to $2,500. If you're getting the now imported uh, SIG arms from Switzerland that are coming in through JDI, uh, those will run you on the market right now on gun broker about five six seven thousand dollars plus unless you're lucky enough to get one of the you know um, uh, get on one of the uh, uh the batches the very few batches that are coming into the country so you have to kind of be the first to the list to get those and i think they're selling those between about three and four thousand dollars if you're lucky enough to get on one of those lists i'm having trouble figuring out how to do that myself but uh anyway 
getting something like this is a lot less expensive and can offer uh, much less expensive training, which is exactly the reason you come out with a 22 caliber version of the full size, you know, variation, the 5.56. Uh, like Chris Vector has a 22 caliber version of their firearms. Uh, the Breda ARX, there's a 22 caliber version of that. There's a 22 caliber uh, caliber version of the SCAR. There's 22 caliber version AR-15s like the M&P 15 Sport, uh, 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 sorry, M&P 1522 Sport rifles. Uh, so something like this is just really, really cool to get and go plink around with at a lot less expensive ammunition if you have a 5.50 series of rifle and you don't want to burn up your 5.56 ammunition. Or if you want to get into the style altogether and you don't want to drop, you know, five six thousand dollars or $2,500 to get into the 5.56 version. So really cool to see this come in. I have never had one of these in my store before, so these, even as a 22, inherently are very uncommon. So really, really cool to get in and happy to share that with you guys here on the video. Okay, up next I have a couple of really cool rifles and these come to us from two separate customers. This one coming to us from West Virginia, this one coming to us from Florida. So thank you so much for sending these along to us. What I have here are two Springfield Armory M1A rifles chambered in 308, and these are known as the Scout Squad configurations with the 18 inch barrel. Both looking a little bit different, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now the story with this would begin with the M14, which served in the early years of the Vietnam War before it was replaced by things like the XM16E1, the M16, and then later the type classified M16A1 as being produced pre predominantly by Colt. Um, now in the late 1960s, we have the closing of Springfield Arsenal. Now the Arsenal is not to be confused with Springfield Armory, which is a private firm that exists today in Illinois. The Arsenal owned and operated by the United States government would make things like the M1 Garand, and the M14, as well as a couple other H&R, for example. Uh, but that would be closed by McNamara as it was determined that it was a lot easier and often much more beneficial to have private firms like Colt or H&R or FN produce firearms for the, for the military. And that's a concept that's really done worldwide now. Don't really have a lot of state-run arsenals uh, anymore in, in most countries. Um, as time would go on, we have again the adoption of the M16. These would go out of service as a main standard issue rifle. They're still used today in a more of a DMR type role. Uh, and then, you know, the, the war would end through the 70s and 80s. You would start to see a lot of competitive shooting kick up in places like Camp Perry. And previously, things like the M1 Garand would be very popular for the use of competition. But people wanted to use the more modernized M14 rifle. The problem with the M14 is it was a select fire rifle, so surplus. Uh, M14s were hard to source, they were hard to, you know, get your hands on, do the paperwork, they were under tight control with the NFA. At least pr uh, prior to 1986, they were a lot more affordable than they are today, but still people would rather get something that they could just go buy off a retailer shelf, not have to worry about the paperwork and the added costs and all the headaches associated with that. So out of Camp Perry, there were two competitive shooters by the name of Elmer Balance and Melvin Smith who came up with a civilian, newly manufactured version of the M14, which was essentially this. It was a cast receiver instead of a forged receiver. And at the time had been built on a lot of surplus M14 parts, which were readily available. Now the two of them would found a company in Texas manufacturing the rifle and it would quickly be purchased by another gentleman by the name of Bob Reese. Now, Bob Reese would move the company to Illinois under the name Springfield Armory, which is where it exists today, manufacturing things like the M1A. Now the traditional line of the M1A would start with the standard model, which was based very closely off the M14 with a 22 inch barrel. You would have things like the standard model, which was their base, either in a walnut, walnut or composite or polymer stock. You could then get the loaded or the national match. And your pricing today ranges anywhere from about $1,300 to about $2,500, depending on the configuration you're getting. A couple other things they did is they added different barrel lengths. You have this with an 18-inch barrel known as the Scout Rifle. They have the SOCOM uh, with about, I think it was about 16 to 16 and a half inch barrel. Uh, they have the tanker version now as well. So you could get different barrel lengths as well. And a lot of people like sort of the... Uh, the good compromise of the Scout Squad with the 18 inch barrel. Not too short, not too long, to a lot of people it's just right, and that's what I have two of here. Now these have been dressed up because the aftermarket support on these is pretty extensive, so there's a lot of different things you can do with them. Depending on barrel length, doesn't really matter, the stocks are all interchangeable. Uh, so it's really, really cool to be able to dress them up how you want to. This is like an AR-15 buffer tube, so you can put AR-15 stocks on it. This is a Veltor stock. Um, this also has on it a Sage quick removable 
uh, scope mount. This is a, a, a Knight's Armament quad rail. So lots of different manufacturers are doing stuff for this. This is an Archangel, more of a bench configuration for more long range precision shooting with a Harris style bipod mounted to it. So again, these are exactly the same rifle, just set up in two different configurations, which are both inherently very different from how they were purchased new. So really, really cool platform. I've always really liked the M1As. In a lot of ways, it is an antiquated type of design, but in 308, it's still a heavy hitter, a lot of fun to shoot, a lot of fun to own, uh, collect. And so uh, there's those. If you like other more classic variations of the uh, of the M14, uh, more on the milled receiver, you can get things from like Fulton Armory or James River, which can be up to about two to three thousand dollars but something a little bit more price sensitive for somebody who just wants to go out and have a lot of fun the m1a's have always been a good option so there are just two of them there for you happy to share them with you okay up next is a really really cool and popular revolver that comes to us from a local customer so thanks for selling this one to us this is a smith and wesson r8 built on the 327 line from smith and wesson now the 327, if you're not familiar, is actually popularized by Jerry Michalek, who's a very famous competition shooter. It's one of his favorites to use in competition due mainly to the ergonomics and the lightweight nature. It is built on the end frame and it is uh, using scandium as a construction material due to its robust and lightweight nature, which of course is gonna make the price a little bit higher, but very, very light and ergonomic revolver. Now the R8, of course, being part of the 327, has a couple added features to it, like a accessory rail here on the bottom and here on the top. Really nice beefy and ergonomic grip. Very, very smooth double single action trigger, which you're going to get on all three uh, 327 series. You have nice uh, high vis front sight. This is a five inch barrel. Now they came out with a TRR8 tactical response revolver eight, which is identical to this, except the bottom rail is not integral to the barrel, which this one is. So you can remove it as well as the top rail is not integral, but it is not integral to the R8 as well. Now it gets the name by being an eight shot 357 or 38 or 38 plus P and it is cut for moon clips. Now the whole concept here is to take the tactical idea, tactical response revolver, and married it into the classic concepts of revolvers. Typically, we don't think of revolvers as tactical, so this is about as tactical as a revolver can get. The philosophy here was developed out of a request from the NYPD for a tactical revolver to be used alongside ballistic shields. Now, if you use a semi-automatic with a ballistic shield, you are prone to stoppages if you accidentally bump uh, the, the moving slide against some portion of the shield, a little cutout notch for you to, you know, stick the firearm through or if you get any other type of malfunction or jam it's hard to clear because your offhand is occupied by the shield itself typically because your ballistic shield operators are the front line of defense upon entry into a potentially hostile area it is good to have something that's going to be inherently more reliable and can be used more reliably in a single hand position so being a 327 it's a very usable because it's easy to carry and lightweight enough to be handled by one hand you don't need your offhand to potentially clear jams or malfunctions. And you have all the added benefits of rails. Uh, if you wanna add a flashlight, a laser, an optic, or anything like that. So how much police use these R8s or TRR8s have received, I'm not too sure, but that was really the philosophy behind this design. Really, really cool. Uh, on the market today, you're gonna to find these around the $1,200 mark, which for a Smith & Wesson, especially one on a Scandium frame, is not unreasonable for what you're getting. So really, really cool. Happy to share that with you guys. And that is a Smith & Wesson R8 revolver. Okay, up next is a very, very desirable rifle. This is actually a pistol that comes to us from a viewer in Texas. And this is a Sig Sauer MCX Virtus pistol with a stabilizing brace on it. And this one's chambered in 5.56. Now the very first variation of the MCX would come out onto the market it would actually be announced at SHOT Show in 2015, but would not really be widely available on the market until about 2016. It was basically taking the concept of the AR-15 and completely switching it on its head, doing one of the major things that most people complained about with the AR-15, which was removing the necessity for a buffer tube. So you move your recoil spring assembly here into the top portion of the receiver. You no longer need a buffer or buffer spring going into the buffer tube. Therefore, you can add things like a collapsible stock. Some other cool and innovative features included a gas system. So this is a gas piston operated firearm and a quick change or semi-quick change barrel. So so you could switch it out to different calibers like 300 blackout. 
Now, about a year after coming out with the base model, they would come out with the Virtus, which is typically regarded as the generation two of the line. Um, and they're very, very popular today. Now, typically you would find them retailing at least the first variations under normal market conditions. You would find them retailing around the $1,600 mark, the Virtus around the $2,000 mark. But lately, because of the scarcity of these, they have been uh, a lot higher in price. And I've seen the Virtus pistols with the brace going between about two and three thousand dollars respectively so there is a huge amount of demand out there for these right now and rightly so i mean they are a really really cool and probably to a lot of people the most modern iteration off of the ar-15 concept that you can get now of course this isn't really inherently an ar-15 um, but it definitely takes a lot of cues a lot of the interchangeability of parts of course magazines uh, things like that and the ergonomics and the uh, sort of the the functionality of the controls is all going to be right at home to somebody who uses AR-15s. Now these are still manufactured today. I don't know why they are so scarce on the market, but for whatever reason they are. Uh, but yeah, you can get this in a carbine configuration as well, as well as a pistol. You can get them in an SBR version already manufactured from uh, from the factory. And just like SIG, they have different finish types. This one here is in the FDE. You typically see them in sort of like a dark tungsten gray, or you can get them in black. So the options are really endless. There's not much else to say about it, but it is a very, very popular design, a really popular package. There's a lot you can do with them with the caliber conversions and everything like that. And it really comes out of the box ready to go with any type of lights, lasers, additions you want to have. The earlier or the, the Virtus more modern generations are going to have the M-Lock uh, mounting points, whereas the earlier one, uh, the, the standard MCX, is going to have the key mod. If you like a 9mm variation of that, you're looking at the MPX, which they manufacture similar in this type of package but a, a straight blowback uh, nine millimeter as well so really really cool concept and probably one, again one of the most popular tactical rifles on the market so if you have not seen one definitely try and get your hands on one and try it out really really cool very light recoil on poles very maneuverable very lightweight at about six to seven pounds uh, very reliable so there is that sig mcx virtus all right up next we have a really cool rifle that comes to us from a viewer in texas so thank you so much for sending this one along to us this is the colt h bar elite car a3 precision bench rifle in the ar-15 platform out of colt's catalog this is known as model cr 6724 uh stamped 223 it will I assume it will also shoot 5.56, most modern AR-15s do. Now these would start being produced by Colt actually in about 1997 in their H-Bar line. Uh, they are still manufactured, I guess we should say still manufactured today. I know that their AR-15 production has been a little bit weird over the past couple years with their decision to stop make, making them. Now they're making the carbines again, so I don't know if they're going to keep up with these in their current catalog. Also there's the bankruptcy and restructuring and everything that's going on now. Uh, what this essentially is, is an out-of-the-box, ready-to-go, target precision AR-15. What you get out of the box is a free-floated aluminum handguard, a 24-inch heavy stainless barrel with target crown, and a 1-9 and nine twist. You do have an upgraded trigger. Um, trying to see what else. This is a Colt C-marked M16 bolt carrier group. Now, the original rifle out of the box would have a A2 stock and A2 grip. This was upgraded by the previous owner into a Magpul PRS stock with what looks like an upgraded, this always reminds me of like a German PSG-1 uh, grip on it, but obviously for bench and precision use. If you've never used these socks before, these PRS stocks, really, really good stock options. Anything that'll fit a standard AR-15 buffer tube, uh, if you wanna use it for precision use, I definitely like these. You have uh, length of pull and comb height adjustment, so really, really nice. Now, as mentioned, it is not too easy to find these on the new market, at least not that I have found. Uh, used, they're actually not too expensive for what you're getting. I'm finding them anywhere from about $800 to $1,000, depending on condition and what they come with. Of course, mounted with scopes and stuff, it's gonna be at the higher end plus of that. Um, so for an out-of-the-box, ready-to-go precision AR-15, if you wanna do just uh, bullseye shooting, varmint hunting, things like that, a really, really cool product. Uh, the CAR and the name CARA3 is for Colt Accurized Rifle. The name is a little bit of a misnomer as Colt has used the, the CAR uh, title or acronym if you want. Uh, and a lot of their products, even dating back to Vietnam with the early Commando, uh, M, early M4 or carbine rifles. Um, and I've heard people allude to CAR standing for Colt Automatic Rifle or CAR being the first three letters in the word carbine. So CAR short for carbine. So 
Anyway, at least on this series of rifle, the CAR is for Colt Accurized Rifle, and then you have the H Bar uh, Heavy Barrel uh, Elite. So really, really cool product. Really happy to get this in and share it with you guys. And again, a big thanks to our, our viewer down in Texas for sending this one along to us. Okay, last but not least, I have a couple really cool Romanian AKs. Uh, up here at the top, this is a Romanian WUM-1 762 by 39 which comes to us from the same viewer in Texas who sold us that Colt A3 you just saw. And down here, I have a local bring-in. Uh, this is a Wasser II, chambered in 545 by 39 So this is a good sort of evolutionary sort of discussion point here between the two. So if we start up here at the 1-1, one, one, this was the first variation of the imported Romanian AK to come into the United States between the years 1997 and the year 2000. Now there would be basically two variants of the 1-1, one, one, an early pattern and a late pattern, you know, respectively, if you will. This is an early, and the early ones would be defined by a square cut to the back of the receiver, which is ideal so you can switch out any other type of stock uh, set configuration you want to put on it. And another big thing is the uh, the thread up here was actually this was actually a threaded barrel, a 14 by one left hand, and it does have a muzzle nut that's threaded over it but it is tack welded here. So if you get something like this, you could just break the tack weld and remove that and you have your barrel threads to put it on any type of muzzle device. Of course, 1997 was the height of the assault weapons ban, which ranged from 1994 to 2004. So firearms that came into the country had to be featureless. So you had thumb hole stocks, could not have a threaded muzzle, could not have a bayonet lug. Uh, earlier Wasser and Romanian AKs would come in with a 10 round single stack magazine well, which would be adapted and opened by the importers of those rifles. Now, the later WUMs, again, this is only a three-year period, would be uh, noted by a crescent or, or kind of a circle cut to the back of the receiver, making it so that the receiver could only accept the thumbhole stock, so a Dragunov style thumbhole stock or PSL uh, style thumbhole stock. And then they would actually turn down the threads at the end, so, you know, there wasn't you know, any way to mount any type of accessories. And then the uh, the lack of the accessory rail or the bayonet lug was the same on those as well. So these, if you get, are actually regarded as probably the best Romanian AKs that have ever come into the country. You can actually convert it back totally to any type of AKM configuration you want to. The only thing you'll be missing is the bayonet lug, if that's important to you. Uh, 1-1 one, one, Kerr 762 by 39 really, really cool rifles, very robust. The scope rail over here is actually for a PSL. It is not a standard ac accessory rail, but the early PM63s were that way as well. Um, not much else to say about that. Just a really, really cool rifle, very early uh, import. Now, still during the imported area, these WUMs were brought in by a company called Intrac. This was pre-Century Arms, who is the primary importer of Kugir, Kugir made Romanian AKs that come into the country today. Now, when Century would get involved, they would start bringing in what was known as the Wasser line. And the Wassers, of course, started coming in prior to the end of the assault weapons ban in 2004. So they would also be featureless. This is a Wasser II. Now, the standard Wassers were 762 by 39, the Wasser II was 545 by 39, and the Wasser III was 556. This is essentially as close as you can get to like an MD-83 or an AIM-74, uh, you know, the Romanian military AK-74 variant, if you will, would come in with a polymer stock, of course, featureless, so you have no threads at all here at the end, no tacked on muzzle nut, no bayonet lug, uh, would have had a compliant stock as well. Now this, the furniture has all been replaced to make it look more like an AIM-74. So you have the forward swooped dong grip here at the front and a correct push button side folding stock. Uh, the latch variations were used by other countries. Romanians were identified by a push button release, which is what this has on it. Of course, you have your Bakelite Romanian pistol grip here and a Tapco uh, stock. Again, these would come in with single stack mag wells that would be cut open upon importation by Century Arms. Now, at the exclusion or the, the sunset of the assault weapons ban in 2004, uh, you have uh, Century bringing in what was known as the Wasser, uh, I'm sorry, the GP Wasser 10, or the GP Wasser 1063s as well. A GP standing for general purpose because they were now allowed to put the features back on the firearms, calling them general purpose now. The 1063s were built with PM63 parts. Now they're all built with completely 100% brand new parts. Now the cool thing about these Romanian imports is they are uh, completely built in Romania, imported into the country, uh, except for having to put on the, the um, uh, the 922R compliance parts like the trigger groups and the furniture and stuff, which is what you see today.
say uh, they are you know totally Romanian imports which is really really cool so the kind of the closest we can get to the Romanian military uh, you know PM 63 or, or uh, different variations of their military AK so really really cool um, not much else to say about these. Really happy to get these in and show them to you. Two early Ban Era Wassers that are not too easy to find right now. So anyway, we're going to wrap it up with that. And I'm happy to have these here to share them with you on the video. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. I'm going to leave you guys off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and we will see you next time.